Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon. Or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. You worked uh, quite a bit uh, with Billy Preston through the years. Um, and, you know, I think he, he was in my view, such an enormous talent, um, you know, great, great keyboardist. And I don't know that he gets as much recognition uh, as he should. Uh, I think that's debatable. But what what can you share with uh, viewers about uh, Billy in terms of his talent and your relationship and experience with him? Well, let me say this. Billy Preston, hands down, beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, you can't even argue the point. Billy is literally the best musician in the world. And the reason I say that is because Billy can do anything from jazz to classical to rock to rockabilly. I mean, you can just start off anything you start off a song. It's called one, two. I've seen Billy get in and they're counting off one, two. What key, what key? And they go, jam, boom, right on the down. <laughs> Billy's there. And from that point on, all the way through the song, without having to try to, where are we going next, you know? A song he never heard before. Who does that? I mean, and he could do that anywhere. I mean, whether it's jazz, whether it's you know, some box stuff, you know, uh, classical or uh, uh, R&B, uh, pop, hip hop. Billy was literally the master. And he, Billy didn't need any charts, you know. And that's where I really got a lot of that stuff from is like, I just followed Billy. You know, I'd follow Billy. And little Richard, Little Richard would always follow my shoulder, watch my shoulder, honey, watch my shoulder, watch my shoulder. And he would be doing his shoulder like that. And I was like, watch your shoulder. But later on, when I when I began to understand what he was saying, the feeling was all in his shoulder. You know, and he just he just watches it. You know, he just watched his shoulder. It's all he had to do was just watch his shoulder. And with Billy, you just listen to where he's getting ready to go. You know, he would always do these impeccable little turnarounds to let you know that something new was getting ready to start. Um, whether it was a course or a bridge, or, you know, um, um, the bridge, the course or the, the verse, wh wherever we were going, there was always something different. But Billy would be consistent at, here's the verse. Uh, here's the course. And now here comes the bridge and it was like that on everything that he played and he was just so so amazing so good and I think that's probably one of the reasons the Beatles liked him they just they, they, they used Billy as a gauge um, definitely beyond a shadow of a doubt the greatest musician 
uh, that I believe that uh, the earth has ever uh, produced. Wow. You can see some of that now with that uh, Get Back documentary of the Beatles are showing because there are segments that shows Billy really doing his thing. And you can really get an appreciation of what a huge influence he was just on the Beatles alone, aside from his incredible own career. Well, I, I haven't seen Get Back yet. I've heard about it, and people have been telling me that nothing surprises me. But, you know, it, it just makes me want to cry sometimes when I think about <clears throat> A lot of people don't really understand if you're a, a people of color like myself and Man like Billy Preston, a black man. And this isn't playing the race card. A lot of folk don't understand that if they're not, if they've not been in my shoes, if they've not been in Billy's shoes. But Billy would tell me that there was actually gigs that he did with the Beatles, and that they don't talk about this, where you would hear two guitars and a bass player and a drummer with some keyboards really down real low in the track, but they were live. But all that you saw was four boys from Liverpool on stage. Where was Billy? Underneath the stage, draped with, with uh, um, um, curtains draped around them and bodyguards standing around the stage that they thought were to protect the Beatles, which it was, but at the same time, you're not going to get through these curtains and find out what's behind you. And it was Billy under the stage playing keyboards with the Beatles because they did not, they would not allow the public to see that the Beatles had a black kid playing keyboards with them, helping them sound good. Mm. Now, a lot of folks say, ah, that's malarkey. We don't want to believe that. That's, and this is the truth. I mean, this is coming, you know, directly from Billy. I mean, Billy would literally cry in my arms from the hurt and the devastation and the pain that he received. Uh, traumatic experiences of growing up playing with the Beatles, but because he wasn't white, he couldn't show his face. That's a travesty right there. <sighs> you know, I'm getting all choked up just thinking about it. But, uh, <clears throat> um, he was well, definitely, he, he was actually, actually a member of the Beatles but just couldn't let it be known at that time because it was during the Jim Crow era. Uh, you know, the queen would have probably went nuts if she had ever, uh, her people would have ever found out. By God, they had a black guy playing in the bond. <laughs> it's, it's just such a head scratcher though. When you think about uh, Alvin, something like, you know, Jimi Hendrix had to go over there to get his break and he was, a black guy, you know, fronting other white players, you know, so that's I ironic, you know, because it's around the same time period. It's just craziness. Well, let me tell you something that you might not know. Eric Burden, for many years, had uh, become uh, very knowledgeable through guys like, uh, you know, Fats Domino, Muddy Waters, and all these B.B. King, these artists, black artists that he grew up that inspired him to be Bo Diddley, who he is as, a, as an artist, you know. And when he came over to America with the animals, Eric Burden and the animals, the same artist that inspired him that he grew up listening to where his band is making or earning I should say $25,000 for the gig here's Muddy Waters 
making, you know, $2,500 opening the show for the Eric, for, uh, Eric Bird and the Animals. Eric did not like that. You know, being the kind of man that Eric is, Eric said, you know what, one day I'm going to, I'm going to go back to America and I'm going to investigate that. And sure enough, when he was coming back from England to check out what it was like to be an American and to find out why was it that blacks were being treated that they were, he was angry at the border when they said, hey, you got anything to declare? He said, yeah, war. War. Yeah, war on America. I'm coming over here to war on America. And that's why he ended up call, calling the man Eric Burden in war. You know? It's the first record, yeah. And here's a white guy singing with an all black band. And he got so uh, afraid about it because of the political stuff that it was, the statements that it was made, that he thought, okay, well, maybe I better back myself up just for another face. Let me call this guy I know over in Sweden, you know, named Lee Oscar and get Lee over here. And uh, so he got Lee to play with him, to help him out and be there with him, just so he wouldn't be the only one they could attack. <laughs> you know? So anyway, Eric's, um, Eric, Eric is, um, man, that, that guy is the most amazing artist. Before we leave uh, the subject of the Beatles, you know, I definitely wanted to touch on, on George Harrison because you worked quite a bit with him and I understand you really hold him in high regard as well. And if you could just share with us a little bit about uh, your experience with him, similar to how you did with Billy. I love George. Uh, you know what? I, I would have never met George without being a friend of Billy Preston's. Um, a friend of ours by the name of Robert Margoloff, a great producer. He's producer. been on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Produced Stevie and, you know, Izzy Brothers. I mean, you name it. Devo. Da, 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 da. Whip, you know, crack that whip, you know, whip it good. Um, wanted to produce the band, The Stair Steps. It used to be called The Five Stair Steps. They had this song, Ooh, child, things are going to get easier. Well, Billy was uh, is a very good friend of Kenny Burke and uh, Clarence. Clarence passed away now, but the brothers, Billy was a very good friend. You know, Billy being a friend of George thought, you know what, George is looking for acts. Maybe he'll like this act, the this, this stair steps. And George was like, man, I love the stair steps. You know, and uh, I mean, I liked them when they did Ooh Chow and at Billy Preston's house, rehearsing. And uh, Billy had invited George over to kind of see the band at the time that we were rehearsing, because we were going to do an album. Uh, whether George was going to have it on his label or not, we, we would have found a label. But George Harrison happened to come in, and he's sitting in the studio on and he began to ask the question, oh, my God, who's that drummer? You know, and, and Billy Preston is like, oh, that's my drummer. It's Alvin Taylor. He's like, wow, I'd like to have him on the album, my album, you know. And um, because when he said the album, he thought on the album with the stair steps. He's like, well, that's why he's here. He's going to do the stair steps album, you know. And so um, by actually doing the Stair Steps album that was produced by Billy and uh, Billy Preston and Robert Margoloff. Um, George uh, ended up loving that album. And it, that matter of fact, uh, that was George Harrison's favorite album, according to what George told me. That's my favorite album, Second Resurrection by the Stair Steps. The album that was produced by B Billy and co-produced by Robert Margoloff. So after uh, George had heard that album and found out I was your drummer on it as well and having a chance to meet me at Billy's house, 
ask me if I would, you know, do his album, 33 and a third. And I told him I would, you know, be honored. It would be a privilege and a, a pleasure to, to do that. And uh, so it was a year later, but finally I got a chance to, to be there on the album, uh, play on the album. Uh, I flew over with Willie Weeks and David Foster. Um, now there's a strange kind of guy, David Foster. <laughs> what a unique talent. What an amazing guy. Um, very quiet to himself at the time. But um, God, right after that album, he blew up real big. He blew up really huge. He was doing everybody's album. And I thought, I wish I was as smart as David Foster. I'd probably be somebody now. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, well, he got his name on a lot of hit songs, that's for sure. Yeah, he does, yeah. And it's great. I'm, I'm happy for him. But yeah, that's... Um, I, I had a chance to actually be the judge on George Harrison's um, video. Um, the song, uh, this song, which was a spoof on him getting sued uh, uh, on um, My Sweet Lord. My Sweet Lord. Uh, and so that George uses a song called This Song. There's nothing tricky about it. This song ain't black or white. It doesn't infringe on anyone's copyright. And meanwhile, it's got this bass line going, do 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 which could be rescue me, do 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 sugar pie honey bunch, do 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 do. It's really funny. There's one bass line that's on like 20 different songs, and George is like, you know what? This song is an E. This song. Uh, it's for for me and you and your aunties, and, and he writes a song about this song. It's actually a joke, you know, about how how the heck can you sue me for a song that has you know um, multiple lines and twenty other songs, you know? But all of a sudden, you're going to take and sue me for it. But anyway, so uh, he wanted to do a video. And asked me to be the judge. He wanted to put a white wig on me and the, the, the robe and everything. But unfortunately, I couldn't do it. And so my idea was that, hey, you know, since Jim didn't get a chance to play on this album, what about, you know, Jim Keltner, using Jim Keltner for it, you know? Because I thought it was really cute, uh, nice, uh, uh, first of all, for uh, uh, Jim had been so instrumental in turning me on to a lot of dates. Um, there was this one song called One, Two, Three, Four that they um, wanted a drummer on uh, uh, Ronnie Wood from the Stones. And Jim said, hey, I got the perfect drummer for you. And Woody is like, hey, no, you're the perfect drummer. I want. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, I got this cat named Alvin Taylor and I want to play on this song. I mean, who does that? I mean, you know, and so Jim Keltner turned me on to this job and I wouldn't have never been able to play with any of the Stones had it not been for Keltner saying, you're going to play drums on this. And I'm like, wow. And it wasn't because he had another gig uh, or that he was going to be busy on that day. It's just that he wanted me. He thought that I had the chemistry for that album. Uh, so I, I did the one song, the one title track, one, two, three, four. And matter of fact, they didn't even have the title of the album until I, I just the way I counted it off, they liked the song. One, two, one, two, three, four. No. <laughs> and they were just like really excited about. But, you know, I really love George Harrison. Um, He's the most unique artist that I ever worked with in my life. Um, he's the only guy that I knew that approached an album uh, from the perspective of um, he would approach it as though he was like a, a director and you're an actor. And as an actor, this is the part that I want you to play for the movie that I got going on here. And so he would sit down in the front of a fireplace with a 12-string guitar, play the song, 
sing the lyrics, talk down the lyrics, tell me the story while he's strumming it and playing it and telling me what he wanted. Uh, he, he wouldn't tell me exactly what to play, but what he would like, how he would like for me to paint the picture of what the drums would sound like with that. And uh, that was on every song. He never told me exactly what to play ever, but gave me an idea of what he wanted me to play and step back and let me do it. You know, never once tried to micromanage how I played it. It was pretty unique. He was very conceptual, sounds like. Extremely conceptual. Yeah, and it was fun. Um, I know I don't mention much about Bob Welch, who's you know a member of Fleetwood Mac, and uh, Bob Welch and I, uh, we were the only two members of Bob Welch's uh, four albums that I did with him. Uh, with the album Ebony Eyes, um, Sentimental Lady that we did uh, was different from the one that Fleetwood Mac did. Uh, um, that was the only song that he used the members of Fleetwood Mac in on that album. Uh, but Precious Love and Ebony Eyes, all, the, all those songs were all Bob and I. Uh, there's nobody else. Bob did the keyboards. Bob did the, the uh, uh, guitar, the bass, and I did the drums. And I uh, called in my friend Gene Page and did all the uh, string arrangements with Barry White. And um, that's how Bob uh, ended up uh, being a solo artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, you worked with Bill Withers on an album, and you know, we lost mm -hmm. him, uh, I guess, yeah. about a year ago or so. A tremendous artist. Uh, what can you tell us about Bill? Well, Bill was an amazing artist in and of himself. I mean, uh, Bill was um, very unique. Uh, the album that I did with him was called Menagerie with the hit single, Lovely Day. And um, Bill... Um, was just a very unique guy. Uh, started out with kind of um, a statement, uh, like um, Gil Scott Heron uh, was a statement type of an artist uh, about the war, rumors of war, and, you know, just uh, the w political statements, you know. But um, went from that to more of a personal type of, you know, statements, grandma's hands, you know, um, you know. Uh, I don't think Bill would have ever gotten noticed without the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band, which is uh, my friend James Gasson playing drums, um, Bernard Blackman uh, playing guitar, and uh, some of the other guys that were with Charles Wright. Um, from the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. When that band became his band, that really, uh, they sort of really showcased Bill uh, being who he really was. And without those musicians, I don't know if Bill would have ever really gotten the break that he needed. But uh, he was uh, an awesome artist, you know, but... Unique unique vocals, you know, I mean... Oh, so yeah. just Easily distinguished. Yeah. And you mentioned Gil Scott Heron, and you worked with Gil Scott Heron on uh, Secrets, which I uh, really like that album uh, with Brian Jackson. Brian Jackson's been on the show. Um, how did you connect with Gil, and what was it like? You know, what impression did he leave on you? Well, you know, um, interesting. I was asked to come and play on. Angel Dust. And so I never met Gil Scott Aaron. I never shook hands with him, never seen him face to face. I was simply bought into the studio um, through Robert Margoloff. And at the time, Malcolm Cecil was producing that album. And I guess Bob told Malcolm that I would be the the killer drummer for this 
and that you know what he's more of a commercial drummer and if you use him you're going to get a hit I guarantee you Bob told him and sure enough it's really funny the only song I played on is Angel Dust and it becomes the one that's the hit off the album <laughs> yeah that's probably so, one of his bigger hits Gil Skinner. Yeah. and it's funny um uh, I think it was Arista Records. Arista, Arista Records. Um, they had um, Alvin Taylor plays on Angel Dust. And I was like, wait a minute, I don't smoke Angel Dust. I've never played on Angel Dust. I mean, I've played on the song Angel Dust. And Clive Davis heard that and he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to recall all those records that says Alvin Taylor plays on Angel Dust. And I'm going to re-put that out there again so that you get, so that you don't be mistaken that you're, you're an angel dust smoker. <laughs> that is funny. Um, yeah. And you also played on that project. Uh, we talked about this before we went on the air, but Alan, Alan uh, put out Cream City, which was a pretty significant R&B hit uh, in the late seventies. And uh, I bought that album at the time and, uh, I don't know if you played on the whole record or not, but there were some other good tracks on that too. I did. I played on the whole entire album with Elon. Um, we were looking for that one specific song uh, that Clive Davis actually needed. And so we came up with the one song, uh, Rock and Roll Gangster. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, people wonder who the rock and roll gangster is. And nobody knows except for me and Elon. And the rock and roll gangster is Eric Burden. And so we wrote that. Elon uh, wrote the song "Rock and Roll Gangster" about Eric. And of course, I'm playing drums on it. And the Cream City album. We had a keyboardist by the name of Louis Cabaza. I don't know what happened to Louis. Where he's at. Uh, I'm in touch with Randy Rice, the bass player. Yeah, he and I are in touch. And of course, I'm in, Elon, uh, in touch with Elon. As a matter of fact, um, I'll see Elon this, um, in a couple of days. Uh, well, today's Thursday. I'll see him Saturday. Uh, uh, doing, uh, he's going to be um, playing um, um, a private birthday uh, for um, uh, my son. Well, and, well, tell, tell him your interviewer liked that record. I sure will. Yeah. yeah I sure will. Was it, magic, was it Magic Night or something like that on there? It's magic, magic Night, night. Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. It's a Magic Night. That's a good one, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of good tracks on that song. Um, um, I, I love playing on that album. Um, you're credited on back on the right track, Sly Stone. Did you yeah. just do that in studio or did you get to meet him? Oh, no, I was in the studio uh, for months <laughs> with Sly. Uh, it was, it, yeah, boy, I tell you, I was fun working with him. Another genius, total genius. Uh, he's not, uh, if he's, if he's not satisfied with what he's going to what what he wants, then he, he'll scratch the whole thing and start all over again. And so uh, that's the way it was with Sly. I mean, we would we would talk things down at ten o'clock in the morning. We wouldn't get started until two o'clock in the afternoon. And so he's they're very particular about what he wanted and how he wanted it. And so yeah, the back on the right track album. I did the whole album as well. Yeah, I think they had do you remember who you are? Is that on there? Oh yeah. Or remember who you are. Yeah. And do, the song Do You Remember? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's Ooh. a good one too. So, you know, how much of with Sly though, I mean, you know, he's a fan of substances and recreational uh, activities so how much do you think of his his way was his eccentric eccentricity as an artist versus the substance side of things 
I, you know, I don't really think substance had anything to do with how creative he was or wasn't. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, um, substance abuse is a disease. Uh, even though people don't like to think of it as that, they think that, hey, you know what, uh, you have a choice. And, you know, if, uh, you know, there's what's called the phenomenon of craving. And I don't want to get really too much into this, but the phenomenon of craving is limited to a certain specific kind and type of a person. Uh, it doesn't... It doesn't uh, show up in the average temperate drinker or user. And some people can uh, take a one-on-one a -on -one and it's like, oh, okay, good. Okay, so let's go on with the day. You know, I got to go pick up the kids at school. I got to, you know, do a normal life. But, you know, you get a guy who's um, got the phenomenon of craving going. One is too many and a thousand is never enough. And so you got to either learn how to come to the conclusion and the agreement that that's the deal, that once you start, you're not going to be able to stop. You know, maybe that's what the Rufus and Shaka Khan was talking about. Once you get started, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to get too deep in, into that either, Alvin, but I was just curious with Sly in particular because, you know, it's well documented. And I'm such a huge fan of his and uh, just regret that he wasn't able to be more productive during a lot of years uh, that he's been with us um, and put more music out. And just curious, you know, how much of that was due to, you know, other factors or just the fact that he's such a perfectionist and sort of eccentric artist, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also worked with Natalie Cole. Was that um, in person or just a studio? Yes, I was uh, all in the studio together over several months. Yeah, I love your soul album. And so it was, you know, what do you think of her pipes? <sighs> Amazing. A woman could really sing. And what was she like? to work with was she easy temperamental or um very sensitive uh at the time she was basically doing exactly what she was told to do uh by marvin yancey and um um marvin yancey and uh chuck uh, jackson jesse jackson's brother uh, little young brother i think at the time, and so Chuck Jackson, Marvin Yancey were actually the producers, and they were a team together, and they worked real well with her, and they knew what they wanted and how to push her in a certain direction. And, you know. and at that point in your career, when you were doing a lot of the studio work, were you still uh, often going out on, on tour or not so much? Uh, no, I was pretty much doing studio stuff at that time. And was that, was that your preference? Yeah. I had a lot of tours that I um, was offered, but I was told by, uh, um, I'm not going to say specifically who, but that, you know, what? once they find out that you're out on the road traveling, they're not even going to waste time calling you in the studio because they, that's a call that they're going to reserve to someone that they know that's available. Uh, like Ed Green and those guys who are strictly studio guys, Earl Palmer, you know, Hal Blaine. We're going to call those guys because we know that's what they're doing. They're just sitting around waiting for the next album. And so they're not going to call somebody who's out on the road and they got to find out two weeks of trying to trace down the drummer and find out he's out on the road with somebody. So I was trying to make a career of being a studio drummer at that time. Um, yeah, exclusively. And where were you uh, living? You know, were you still living in Palm Springs? No, I was living in Hollywood. I had uh, built a 
a castle up in the Hollywood Hills. Sounds like good times to me. Mm, yeah. And good times, bad times. You know, we've had our share, you know. Yeah. Good times and bad times, yeah. So why, when and why did the uh, studio work start to slow down? Well, um, basically, uh, the whole... The whole scene it just became different. All of a sudden, people started having studios in their own house, and um, you know, composers were starting to get equipment where they could, you know, they can program drums and they could, you know, I say, uh, it's one composer I talked to, and he was like, "Hey, I be honest, man, I'd love to hire you, but you know what?" He says, "I make more money by not hiring you." He said, I don't have to talk back to the drummer. I just program it and tell it to do what I want it to do. He says, it's always on time. And I don't have to pay him. I was like, wow, what a concept. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it's, not, it's not the same people, though. That's the thing. Well, you know, and that's true. But, hey, when you're looking at people who don't understand that and don't care about that, as long as you're able to make uh, the amount of money that they want to make out of it and do what they think is best. You, you, what, what are you going to tell them? You know, what are you going to do? You, know, you, you can fight and tell them the truth and you, you know, never be heard. Yeah, the drummers and the horn players really took a hit as the 80s came on. Yeah. And still, even today. You know, when you mentioned the uh, Sucker for Your Love, Rick James, Tina Marie, I hadn't noticed that in the credits I looked at of yours. Are there any other notable uh, songs or artists that you worked with that maybe I haven't mentioned that people would really know well that maybe you don't get credit for uh, generally? Yeah, Leo Sayer. Yeah, we had a band, that was an amazing band. Uh, Nicky Hopkins was our keyboard player. Bobby Keys was our saxophone player from the Rolling Stones uh, with uh, the uh, trumpet player, Steve Madeo. Oliver C. Brown, the percussionist, uh, the founder of Casey and the Sunshine Band was our percussionist. Reggie McBride who was the bass player. And what an amazing band we had with the Osea. And we went out and toured and worked real hard and you know, built, uh, you make me feel like dancing and when I need you out on the road, you know, uh, made these songs uh, literally what they are today, you know, and uh, did, uh, I think this probably the best band that Leo's ever had. I am, uh, you know, he might think different, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Leo Sayer. And uh, I don't really like um, a lot of time if artists don't want to give me credit for their success or being a part of what they did, I, okay, I just won't mention them. They don't want to give me credits on their album. I don't even talk about them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, hey, that guy didn't give me credit. You know, I'm, okay, well, that's his fault. You know, mm -hmm. too bad for him. <laughs> it's a two-way street. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, looking back, what would you say are maybe one or two of your most uh, unforgettable experiences on a stage? Say um, Eric Burden, uh, for one, um, and the second one, Leo Sayer. But I'm not talking about just in general, one show that like maybe you're, you fell off the stage or the equipment didn't show up or the crowd uh, started rioting or uh, the, the musicians were in such an incredible space, something stands okay. out like that. Pacific Gas and Electric. When they found out that the lead singer was black and we're in a club in Raleigh, North Carolina, 
And man, guns start shooting up in the sky in the club. Uh, people are like what? The the lead singer is a uh, you know what? And then they didn't have any idea that I, the drummer, was also black. But I wasn't gonna let. I wasn't gonna try to say, "Hey, so is the drummer," you know. <laughs> I mean, then once they found out that the black, uh, the lead singer was black. They started rioting. It was like crazy. Raleigh, North Carolina. And this was in, oh, 70, 71. Just crazy. So you, did you guys pl- get to play at all? No, we didn't even do the game. Wow. That's only a couple hours from where I am now. Uh, <laughs> gotta watch out. <laughs> um. And what about in the studio? What what's like just a incredible, unforgettable experience that you could share with us from the studio days? Yeah, and with Sly at Paramount when I came to Paramount Recording Studios on Santa Monica Boulevard, and I was sitting there waiting in the waiting room. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I seen this wall turn around, and this slide pops out of the out of the wall. I'm like, "What? How the heck did they do that?" And they just got this little wall that you push and you you, you go in there, and that's like a that's like a waiting room in there, and it's like a dressing room where the artist can hang out at. So that was probably one of the most incredible things that ever happened to me. And, in the studio there. Surprise. Make you drop your drumsticks, huh? Yeah. I put yeah. a hole, hole in your snare with that. Yeah. Get shocked. Um, and what, what, what are you most proud of? You know, what piece of music or music experience? Well, I, I, I love, um, George Harrison's 33 and a third album kind of felt like I had a chance to express myself. Um, There's none of the albums that I like as far as engineering. Uh, I don't think that my drums have ever really been given a fair sound. I did an album with a guy by the name of Rick Plester uh, out of Austin, Texas, an album called The Trees. And that album is yet to be released, but will be released soon. But it shows me in the light uh, of of the type of drummer that I really am with the sounds and the drums are up front. And it really gives me the, the sound that I need. It's a real, it's a kind of like, Pink Floyd, um, uh, Led Zeppelin, Pink, uh, 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 what's the game? Uh, God, Deep Purple. Uh, all those groups mix in one, basically, and several other groups like that, but more like updated today. And that, that album's coming out soon. It's called The Trees. And I think that's one of the most uh, incredible albums I've ever played on. And I'm very proud of that. When was it recorded? Uh, it was recorded five years ago. And it's just getting to the point where they're mixing and mastering. And uh, it's called The Trees. And there's vocals on it too? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's coming out soon. Definitely have to look for that. You know, um, is there a particular style or genre you feel most uh, at home with? Mm, no, not really. I'm good with all of it. Personal. And what about in terms of your stylistic signature? You know, is there a, a quality or element of your playing in general that you think is sort of a hallmark of just, you know, your stylistic flavor? Turnarounds. Um, I, my turnarounds are different, unique. I don't hear a lot of drummers do the type of turnarounds that I do. Is that something you work to cultivate or just kind of came? 
something that just came and I, it, it, as it came, I developed it. And you're like, hey, I think I'm on to something different here. This is pretty cool, right? Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So the uh, shirtless thing and the turnarounds, that's... Yeah. <laughs> What what do you think? Uh, you mentioned this album coming. Uh, what else do you see moving forward for for you? Well, um, you know, I I'm 68 years old. I have um, um, a family. You know, I have a beautiful wife. Um, four boys, one girl, 13 grandchildren. Wow. Uh, four great grandchildren. Um, I'm 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 excited more and more excited about the time that I get to spend with them together now, and I'm loving that so much that that seems to become for me the most important thing in the world. And it's not so much about sitting behind the drums, even though I love that and re recording and being in the studio and. Um, certainly not uh, opposed to going out on the road. Maybe uh, another good tour uh, may have in me. Um, maybe not. You know, it depends. You know, on uh, what that tour entails, what the um, I'm not sure. I, I really don't know. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking more to just kind of like taking it easy. I'm not really, you know, it's like most people, well, music is my life. And I, you know, music was my life, you know, and it's been a major part of my life, but I don't, I'm not ready to say I'm going to give up everything to go and play music. You know, I have a, you know, I'm a, a responsible husband, you know, and a leader in my community. I have children and I need to set examples for it. You know, I don't know. Um, it might be okay for Mick and those guys, you know, I'm 68 going. years old. That's just time to do something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Did I mean, you ever think that, did you ever think uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they'd still be at it? No, not at all. <laughs> Incredible. Um, well, is there any uh, thing you'd like to share with viewers in terms of, you know, sort of keeping tabs on you or? Well, just, you know, uh, feel free to, you know, to Google my name and it tells you where I'm at. Uh, you know, Alvin Taylor music at gmail.com is my um, email address. Um, you can always contact me there and uh, uh, have Alvin Taylor music on Facebook and Alvin Taylor music uh, um, is uh, my my business name. Uh, but then there's also Alvin Taylor. Uh, I'm on Facebook. And getting ready to, I have a Twitter account. I also have a LinkedIn account. I also have um, TikTok, and I'm getting ready to get that going. So TikTok? Oh, yeah. you're dialed in. That must be some of the grandkids uh, influencing. You got it. <laughs> hey, you know. Yeah, hey, you know, you don't want to be a dinosaur, Dad. Here, do TikTok. You know? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, again, thank you so much. It's been so much fun talking to you. And thank you so much for the music over the years. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a privilege, a pleasure, and I must add an honor to be here. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, 
and linking through Funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the Media Services section at Funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at Funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Wolfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one. Thank <laughs> you.